So please, as the speaker puts into words, examine that which he says for yourself. Because doubt, skepticism, is a great purifier. Most of us are so easily accept things, especially in religious matters, in so-called spiritual matters. Please don't accept a thing what the speaker is saying, but try to find out for yourself by carefully listening, if you are interested, if you don't treat this as an entertainment, then please listen and doubt and question and ask. You are doubting that which you have created yourself. You are doubting your own ideas, your own conclusions, your own experiences, your beliefs, your faiths. You are doubting so that you find out for yourself what is truth. Part of Krishna's teaching, and he told all of us this, he said, um, you must not be dependent. You're all dependent, you've been dependent on me and you, that mustn't be. And he, he would, he put it to me straight between the eyes. He said, are you dependent on me? Meaning psychologically and uh, emotionally. And I, was able to reply, no, I'm not. In public, when he spoke, uh, was an extraordinarily um, compelling figure. He, he, you know, without doing anything, he riveted the attention of a vast number of people and uh, did it without just being the way he spoke. There was an authority which is not the kind of authority that one sees in other people. It was the authority of someone who's speaking about something that he sees very clearly at a great depth. And, um, but his manner always was one of um, grace and a tremendous dignity which he wasn't even aware of. Truth demands a free mind. A mind that is completely free. To doubt requires sensitivity. If you doubt everything, there is nothing, then this becomes rather stupid. But to doubt with light hand, with a quick mind, with subtlety, then the doubt brings about clarity, energy. And we need energy to go into all these problems. On long motor trips, he had described the whole hierarchy of what was believed by the TS and what he obviously was exposed to in his uh, youth, his really childhood. But as he said, he heard it all and it went right out. <laughs> and it went in one ear and out the other, although he, it was familiar to him. That leads me to talk about something that I feel is very important in, in, uh, in one one considers uh, Krishnamurti's teachings. And that is that the the child, as far as one could tell from his own descriptions, was what he called completely vacant. There was a, an a emptiness of mind, which uh, in a way seems to be a possible of explanation of the source of his teachings, that some he wasn't conditioned by 
the way the rest of us are normally. I mean, he knew how to behave and talk and all the things on an, on an ordinary day uh, level. But uh, as far as what his teachings were about, there was no trace of any other uh, influence in that. But he did know enough about the Buddha and the Buddha's teachings to have a great feeling for, uh, for the Buddha. It's the only person he seemed to speak of with um, great respect and reverence, if you like. Scientists, politicians, the educational people, the, the religious people, they are responsible, but I know nothing about it, I just follow. That's the general attitude right through the world. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. I make myself irresponsible. Mm -hmm. By delegating responsibility to you, I become irresponsible. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we are saying, nobody is responsible except you. Mm -hmm. Because you are the world, and the world is you. You have created this mess, you alone can bring about clarity. Therefore, you are totally, utterly, completely responsible, and nobody else. Mm -hmm. Now, that means you have to be a light to yourself, not the light of a professor or an analyst or a psychologist or, a, or the light of Jesus or the light of the Buddha. Or, you have to be a light to yourself in a world that is utterly becoming dark. He gave what I feel is the most revolutionary teaching in the sense of, of what life is about and what human beings are about. And even Buddhism, which I know very little about, so I shouldn't make a comparison, I would say that there are similarities, but um, the similarities are, well, in particular, he did not want followers, he did not want uh, disciples, he did not want any of that. And there was no um, systematized religion. Uh, now, whether, again, I, my ignorance of Buddhism is um, endless, so that may have been all uh, formed after the Buddha died. But there, there is a, I know that Buddhists today, the, uh, we have the talks that are uh, going to be a book now, um, not the talks, the discussions that were held with Buddhists in, in England, uh, Dr. Rahula in particular, and they, of course, um, in the discussion, would say, the Buddha says this, what, you say this, what is the uh, relationship? And he would, the Krishna Ji would say, never mind what the Buddha said, what do you think? You know, he was interested in the living um, thinking of someone like that. He wasn't for dogma, on the contrary, he was totally uh, dismissed it. That means you have to be responsible. Now, what does that word mean? It means really from to respond totally, adequately to every challenge. You cannot possibly respond adequately if you are rooted in the past. Because uh -huh. uh -huh. the challenge is new, otherwise it's not a challenge. A crisis is new, otherwise it's not a crisis. There, that's why, sir, Re responsibility means total commitment. Hmm? Total commitment. Total commitment mm -hmm. to the challenge. Responding adequately, completely, 
to a crisis. That is, that the word responsibility means that, to respond. Mm -hmm. I cannot respond completely if I am frightened, or I cannot respond completely if I am seeking pleasure. I cannot respond totally if my if my act, action is routine, is repetitive, is mm, traditional, is conditioned. So to respond adequately to a challenge means the me, which is the past, must end. The source was Krishnamurti himself. Now there are a whole um, people who believe that that there is some other something that um, he was in uh, contact isn't the right word, but that had uh, a meaning to him. I've never heard him show any sign of that. He would, for instance, um, he would not prepare talks. But there were certain conditions that were made it possible for him to talk. Some of them were physical. Some of them were he um, would have uh, a certain amount of rest and a certain amount of, of um, eating properly and watching his health. He took great care of his health simply um, in order to be able to live the life he led and travel and talk. Because he always said that the day that he can't do that physically, uh, his life would end, and indeed that's what happened. And he was aware of that. And um, the, uh, but he did not like to. He would not prepare a talk almost deliberately, in the sense that when he was in the speaking. Uh, situation, he would speak, but not to plan it ahead of time. Many's the time I've driven him to the talk, and he would say in the car, I wonder what I'll talk about. And I never said a word in reply, but almost invariably, the talk that then took place was extraordinary, I mean, even more extraordinary than others. Violence is not only physical, but great deal much, much more psychological. When I conform to a pattern, when I am being allowed to be programmed, understand? When you tell me what I should do. Because for the good of my soul or my psyche or whatever it is, and you you become the authority. So when I accept authority, there is violence, right? Psychological authority, of course. There is the authority of the computer, the authority of law. The authority of the policeman who says, keep to the left or right. If you drive in Europe, you keep to the right. If you write in England or here, which is it? Left? <laughs> yes, left. Left. No, right? Right. <laughs> I haven't driven lately. Yes, I walk down to the left, walk up the right. That's quite right. <laughs> so, violence must exist where that part of it, where out of my confusion, disorder, I create authority. You understand? I'm confused. I am disturbed, I am want certainty. And you come along, the guru, the priest, the psychologist, the others, 
and they become the authority. I have created them out of my confusion, my disorder. So I realise, as long as there is an authority subjectively, either the ex- experience which I have had, the memory of that experience which becomes the authority, follow all this, or the authority of somebody who says, I know, I will tell you all about it. The nasty, ugly gurus do all this. Coining money. They are the mo- one of the most rich people in the world. Your evangelists, the churches, the tremendous organizations, they say, have faith, believe, accept. And I am so frightened, I say, yes, and gullible, I accept. So I am creating out of my disorder authority. I can't explain it. I can't even describe it. It was as though there was a presence. I don't know. There was a kind of vibrance in, in the air that was intangible. But somehow one felt something. Now, whether that was nothing or imagination, or with something that he felt and saw, that we felt to a lesser degree. I can't, I don't know, I can't. But it was, it, it was, uh, happened a number of times. And I've talked to uh, doctors about it, or one particular doctor in Switzerland who knew him well and who treated him there, and she said that it, the, um, what happened under the pepper tree does not conform to any uh, disease, any illness, any condition of the body. It, it isn't a medically explained fact. And yet these horrendous things happened to him. And the theory then was that, the, um, that there were uh, entities who were um, operating on his brain. And it caused this excruciating pain. It's, it's hard to read. It's so harrowing. <laughs> and, um, but I don't know. There was a great, enormous amount of mystery about, about uh, Krishnaji. And I think this is a, my own interpretation now, but the level of inquiry about these things is one that beware of making interpretations as long as you haven't gone that far in your own understanding and uh, self-discovery. So. Uh, they're mysterious, and I think mystery has a meaning. It, it, makes, um, it makes it for a possibility that there are other states of consciousness, the states of, I don't like to word the use enlightenment as, as the term, because that's so sort of a cliché, really. Who knows what enlightenment is? And if you do, as Krishnaji himself said, If you say you're enlightened, you can be sure the person isn't. (laughs) And I think that's that's sensible. But there's a great deal of mystery about this man. You are second-hand people. Don't pretend you are not. Mm. You are second-hand, sloppy, shoddy people. Mm. And you are trying to find something that is original, God is, the reality is original. Mm-hmm. It's not coloured by all the priests in the world. Mm-hmm. It's original. It, therefore, you must have an original mind, which means a free mind. Mm-hmm. Not an original painting, a new picture, a new this, that's all Tommy Rod. But a free mind. 
A free mind that can function in the field of knowledge and a free mind that can look, observe, learn. Now, how do you help another, or is it not possible to be free? You know? Look, I never belong to anything. I don't. I'm no church or no belief, no all that. A man who really wants to find out if there is eternal, eternal, the nameless, something beyond all thought, he must naturally set aside everything built on thought. The saviour, the masters, the gurus, the knowledge, you know, all of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are there people to do that? You know, are, is, will anybody undertake that journey? Or he said, Well, you tell me all about it, old boy. I'll sit comfortably <laughs> and then you tell me. <laughs> yes, yes, that's, that's what goes on. I, I say, I won't. Describe that. I won't tell you a thing about it. That's n- to put it into words is to destroy it. He would say, not just to me, but to those close to him, there are certain things that he uh, could not talk about. Uh, he said, I'm not allowed to, which is a curious uh, way of putting it. But he felt, I think it, we've discussed this, or it's well known. He felt very much that something else controlled his life. What that was, he did not describe. But he was, um, he he would refer to it. Other things, something else decides what happens to me, he said. Particularly with regard to his life, how long he would live. And more than that, he had a sense also, I'm, I'm sure that this has been recorded by other people, of being protected by some thing, something. What it was, he did not uh, divulge. But the implication was that something, a powerful something, was in charge of his life. And, uh, but what that was, he did not uh, describe. Uh, let us see if you cannot be free. What are you frightened about? Frightened of authority, frightened of going wrong, but you are completely wrong the way you live. Completely stupid the way you are carrying on. There's no meaning. Keep, you follow, sir? Deny the author- spiritual authority of every kind. Because what are you frightened of? Going wrong spiritually? They are wrong, not you are wrong, because you are just learning. They are they are the established in unrighteousness. <laughs> <laughs> that is beautiful. Yes. And so why do you follow them? Why do you accept them? They are degenerate. And can you be free from all that? So that your mind, through meditation, which we'll discuss at perhaps another time, what it means to be free, what it means to wipe away all the things that people have put on you. You understand? So that you are innocent. Mm -hmm. Your mind is never hurt is incapable of being hurt. That is what innocence means. And from that inquiry, let's take a journey from there. You follow, sir? Mm-hmm. From this sense of negation of everything that thought has put together. Because thought is time. Thought is matter. And if you are living in the field of thought, you will never. There will be never freedom. 
frivolous are. Unless this is told, repeated, shown to them, they can talk endlessly about books. This comes first. Then you can read the books. But he simply was clearly an extraordinary and very mysterious person. One didn't... Um, the kind of judgments we all make about each other were not uh, not to be made about Krishnamurti. I felt, and that's not just the, the excess of uh, admiration or devotion, he was of a different order of human beings. In, um, and it wasn't... It was somehow natural that he should be there. There was a very, very strong feeling uh, for me and, and others too, that this was, um, there was something sacred about this man uh, and his life and what he was doing. And uh, it was very, it was palpable. I mean, you, being with him, there were times when you or I, in this case, sensed that he was rather far away and not to intrude on that. He was showing the wholly wrong way that human beings have approached life and the understanding of life, and that is that he was giving a way of not echoing always the past. He said, we live Human beings live in the past. We all live in thought, the whole business about thought, which you know very well. Uh, most people never live in the present at all. They either live in, in the past or they project the past into tomorrow and the next year and so forth. And to show that that is a false way of living, and not more than false, it's a... Uh, doesn't correspond to reality. He was trying to get people to see that the human brain is, needs to, through attention, he said, attention is the whole thing that uh, will enable people to see the falseness of the way they are thinking. And every religion that I've ever heard of is full of tradition and you must do what uh, Shankara said, and whenever it was, and he must do what um, St. Paul said, and so forth and so on. Um, that is totally contrary to what the human being should be doing, which is to perceive reality, things as they are this moment. <laughs> 